part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now turn over and look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Um, so, Anita, what has brought you to counselling? So, I've been in a relationship with somebody for about six months. Um, okay. I wanted us to move forward with our relationship and, you know, get married. And he, he's not on the same page as me, and it's causing a lot of tension. And then, in addition to that, my mother's very unwell. Um, mm -hmm. So, I have a lot of things to deal with at home with her as well. And then, um, my boss is putting a lot of pressure on me to deliver um, everything on time. And so, I'm just having some trouble juggling everything at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I can see that um, all of these combined are, are making you feel quite overwhelmed. Oh, very. And it's just really, there are some times when I just come home and I have to deal with my mother and I have to deal with my relationship. And then I have to go to work the next day and I, I'm having trouble with that. And it just makes me really upset. Okay. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Annette, how, um, how long have you been dealing with all of these issues? Oh, um, it's probably ramped up in the last three months, um, but I've been in, the, in my relationship for six months and my mum's been sick uh, for the last three, four months. So it's not that new, but it's, it's now starting to get worse. So Yeah, yeah. Um, so how have you been coping so far with all of these, these pressures? Not very well, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just take it day by day and um, yeah, communication is a bit of a difficult one. Like I said, this is my first time doing counselling and yeah. don't really have anyone else I can turn to. So, yeah, mm. it's very hard. Yeah, um, I, I do understand that it is very hard to, to seek um, support in, in such personal issues, but that's what we're here for and that's what um, we're hoping that we can do with, um, with this session as well. Um, so... Given that this session's um, very different to the other ones, I just wanted to know, you told me that you um, are experiencing some concerns with your partner because you want to move forward and he's not in the same uh, place as you and your mother's quite sick and um, you're looking after her as well so that's an area of concern for you and then you have some pressures with work. Um, so I'm just wondering if we could prioritise any of those concerns, what would the, the biggest concern be? Um, well, probably dealing with my mother and my relationship are probably quite equal because my mother is also putting a lot of pressure on me to yeah. get married. Obviously, she's not well, so, um, you know, she wants to see her family happy. Yeah. yeah. Dealing with that situation is probably the number one thing for me at the moment and the work thing I can deal with because I try not to bring work home but obviously that's a bit hard too. Yeah. So when you say dealing with that concern do you mean working uh, the relationship with your mother or the relationship with your partner? Probably with my partner first because yeah I feel like I'm putting a lot of pressure on him yeah. because of what's happening with my mother. Yeah. Okay, so what we, we can do is, um, if it's okay with you, focus on that area first and we will look at all the areas that are overwhelming you, um, but we can start by working on that, that issue first, if that's okay. Yeah, yep. excellent. Um, so we only have a couple more minutes before the session ends um, and I was wondering if you had any other questions before we, um, we go and sign the contract. and. 
Um, no, just maybe in terms of the number of counselling sessions I'll need. I know you said that the first six are free, um, but obviously money is a bit of a factor as well. So what happens if I have to go over the um, six sessions? Yeah, um, and I do apologise, I said when we'll go and sign the contract, but you already signed it. But um, So if you go over the six sessions, it will be $70 after for each session. Um, and you can, like I said, you can um, continue as long as you need to. So it's really difficult to find a time for every single person and, and have a set time. So we like to see how it goes and together we can work out what the best um, time frame is for, for yourself. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, so if you don't have any other questions, we can book another time in next week. For you? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do I speak to reception about that? Yeah, well, I'll come out with you and we can um, sort that out. Great, thank you. Okay, it was lovely meeting you. Nice and meeting thank you, you so too. much for um, for uh, opening up and, and having that chat with me. Um, and we'll focus on uh, the, the first um, topic of you and your partner. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Now look at the notes for extract 2. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear an optometrist talking to a patient called Marcia Samarina. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. Now, Jane, just before we begin, can I start by asking you your age? Uh, I'm 25. Okay. And what brings you in today, Jane? What's the problem? Um, well, I've been feeling a bit tired for the past few weeks, and I don't seem to have much energy to do anything, really. And I was wondering if you could tell me what's wrong with me. Okay. Um, well, tell me a little bit more about it. Um, well, I started to get tired about four weeks ago, and it's really yes. persisted since that time. Um, and I've actually had to stop playing netball because I've, I've been so tired. Um, when it started off, I had some aches and pains in my muscles, and um, but they seem to have settled down now, and it's really just the, the tiredness that's persisting. And um, I've got exams in a few weeks, and I'm really worried that I won't be able to study properly because I'm feeling so tired. I see. Goodness, that must be very distressing for you. Yeah, it's really worrying me. Yeah. What uh, What are you studying? I'm a social work student. I see. Well, tell me, um, apart from the aches and pains that you noticed initially with this illness, was there anything else in particular that you'd noticed? Um, it sort of started quite suddenly, really, and when it started, I had a bit of a cold, um, you know, a bit yes. of a blocked up head and a runny nose. Um, and I actually went to the doctor at student health at the university yeah. and he said I just had a virus and I didn't need any treatment and it would go away. Um, and he didn't do anything else than that really. Right, okay. So at the moment, just to let me clarify again, the main problem now is tiredness. All of the other symptoms have, have settled down. Um, yeah, just really tired and I can't do anything really. Right, okay. Well, just before I actually start examining you, can I ask you a few just general questions before we get started, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what's your appetite and weight been like? Um, my appetite's been fine. I've been eating the same amount and my weight's steady. Okay, and have you been running any fevers recently? No, no. Um, four weeks ago when I had a bit of a cold, I thought I had a bit of a temperature then, um, but nothing now. Mm, okay. And um, your bowel habits? Oh, I've been regular. Regular, that's good. All right, well, look, I think um, at this stage I'd like to have a bit of a look at you and um, we'll talk about 
at um, things after that, okay? All right. All right. Right, Jane. Having had a look at you, I think really the major things that uh, that are noticeable are that you've you've uh, got some scattered glands around your body. Okay, those lumps that I felt um, in the neck, armpits, and down in the groin regions, and you may have also noticed a bit of discomfort up in the left side of your abdomen, high up, when I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And yes. that, um, that is the site of, a, of an organ called the spleen, which is also a, a type of gland which is also enlarged, okay? Mm. So what I does that think, mean? I think all of these really point to some form of viral illness, quite possibly um, glandular fever. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask as well, are you absolutely sure it's glandular fever? Mm. It's highly suggestive, okay. I can't be totally certain um, at this stage without really doing um, some tests to confirm it, and I think that would be a good idea to do. What sort of tests are they? It's a blood test, and it will involve a small sample of blood being taken. Really, what I'll do is do a specific test for glandular fever as well as looking at your blood in general to make sure that there are no other possible problems there. And that can tell for sure if it's glandular fever? Uh, it, yes, that's correct. Right. Um, and when you do the blood tests, can you see if I'm anemic as well? Yes, certainly. Is that a particular concern of yours? Yeah, well, I've been having all those ads on the TV, you know, about if you don't eat enough meat, then you might be anemic, especially if you're tired. And I was wondering if that was my problem as well. Okay. I mean, tiredness certainly can be... Uh, one of the symptoms of anemia and I think it's justified that you're concerned about it particularly given the, the publicity that we've been having but um, I can fairly confidently reassure you just on having examined you that that would be very unlikely in your case okay but we can certainly uh, run that test and in fact I was going to run that test as a routine anyway oh, oh that's good Right. What you need to do really at this stage is rest, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there are no specific remedies that I can give you for this illness. Um, we can't cure it. Your own body will cure it by, by fighting it off, but that will take a bit of time. Um, how long exactly? Again, I can't, I can't be certain. Hopefully within the next week or two you'll be feeling a lot better, but that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Um, at home, really, um, you need to keep up your diet and keep up your fluid intake, and really we're going to have to organise to meet again and just make sure that this is slowly settling with time. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining to his staff about cutaneous manifestations. Now read the question. Cutaneous manifestations are the medical consequences of starvation, vomiting, abuse of drugs such as diuretics and laxatives, and of psychiatric morbidity. These manifestations include lanugo-like body hair, cirrhosis, carotenoderma, telogen evluvium, acne, seborrheic dermatitis, hyperpigmentation, acrocyanosis, petrique, pernosis livido reticularis, interdigital intertrigo, Peronychia, generalized pruritus, acquired sture distente, slower wound healing, purigo pigmentosa, edema, linear arrhythmia, crelecae, acral coldness, pellagra, scurvy, 
and acrodermatitis enteropathica. The most characteristic cutaneous sign of vomiting is knuckle calluses called Russell's sign. Symptoms arising from laxative or diuretic abuse include adverse reactions to drugs. Symptoms arising from psychiatric morbidity include the consequences of self-induced trauma. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining to his staff about symptoms of anorexia nervosa. Now read the question. Multiple studies of anorexia nervosa patients have revealed a decreased left ventricular mass, cardiac output, left ventricular index, and left ventricular diastolic and systolic dimensions. Long-standing hypovolemia has also been seen in the patients. Mitral valve motion abnormalities, including mitral valve prolapse, were also seen in a distinct minority that can cause chest pain and palpitations but the ejection fraction seems to remain preserved in most patients. However, weight restoration had a significant impact in normalization of cardiac dimensions. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a physician and his nurse about endometriosis. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is a disorder when the tissue that forms the lining of uterus grows outside of the uterine cavity. It is abnormal for endometrial tissue to spread beyond the pelvic region. This condition is known as an endometrial implant. The hormonal changes of the menstrual cycle impact the displaced endometrial tissue, causing the region to become painful, inflamed, and making the tissue grow thicker and finally break down. At one stage, the broken tissue has nowhere to go and becomes trapped in the pelvis. Question 28. You hear a discussion between the physician and his nurse about treating the signs of eating disorders. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what kinds of treatment measures do you suggest for the signs caused due to eating disorders? Although skin signs of the patients with eating disorders improve as they gain weight, the dermatologist is responsible to treat the dermatological conditions as well. Antibacterials or azelaic acid is effective to treat acne that these may be described as monotherapy or in combinations. Combination zinc with antibacterials such as ethromycin are also suggested because zinc deficiency can be a possible cause for this sign. Angular stomatitis, sheolitis, and nail fragility can be treated with topical tocopherol. Cirrhosis improves with moisturizing ointments. Ointments that contain urea are effective in decreasing the size of Russell's sign. Question 29. You hear a discussion between a physician and his junior about pain transmission. Now read the question. Hello doctor, what is the theory of pain transmission? Well, the nerve fibers that are connected to the receptors in the skin, muscles, and organs called primary afferent axons transmits the pain signals to the brain and spinal cord. These axons of various sizes may be myelinated or unmyelinated that are classified into different groups based on their size, namely A-alpha, A-beta, A-delta, and C-nerve fibers. 
All of the A afferent axons fibers are myelinated, while C afferent axons fibers are unmyelinated. The thickness of a fiber determines the speedy transmission of information. According to the gate control theory of pain, the pain is a function to balance between the information traveling into the spinal cord through large and small nerve fibers. Small nerve fibers transmit non-susceptive information of the pain, whereas large nerve fibers carry non-nociceptive information. The large and small axon nerve fibers synapse on projection neuron cells to the brain and on inhibitory interneurons within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The firing of the projection neuron signals pain to the brain. The inhibitory interneuron decreases the chances of the firing of the projection neuron. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a physician and his nurse about subclinical seizures. Now read the question. Hello doctor, when do subclinical seizures occur? Well, subclinical seizures occur due to unusual electrical activity within the brain. Often, the symptoms are unnoticed, even by the patient. The only method to detect subclinical seizures is performing an electroencephalogram to measure the electrical activity of the brain. That can capture the seizure activity. At times, subclinical seizures are mistaken for the abnormal behavior of autistic patients. For instance, an autistic student showed good cognitive development in his studies last year. However, this year his progress has slowed down. Signs such as aggression or meltdowns were seen in the patient. He used to daydream and ignore others when anyone asked him anything. This condition was mistaken by his parents for autism. All such signs are often mistaken for behavioral issues linked with autism that can actually be connected with a subclinical seizure. According to findings, subclinical seizures may be the cause of psychiatric disorders or compulsive and behavioral disorders or even schizophrenic, criminal, and antisocial activities. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the doctor briefing his staff about guidelines for the early detection of cancer. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Guidelines for the Early Detection of Cancer I am going to explain to you the guidelines for screening different types of cancers. These screening tests are suggested to detect cancer before the patient develops any symptoms. Colon and rectal cancer and polyps Starting regular screening at the age of 45 is suggested for people at average risk of colorectal cancer. The screening can be performed either with a sensitive test that examines for cancer signs in the stool of the person or with an exam to look at the colon and rectum. 
This can be done either with a sensitive test that looks for signs of cancer in a person's stool or with an exam that looks at the colon and rectum. If the person is maintaining a good health, he should continue with regular screening through to the age of 75. For people aged 76 to 85, they should confirm with the physician whether continuing with the screening is right or not. People above 85 should no longer get colorectal cancer screenings. If the person wishes to be screened with a test other than a colonoscopy, any abnormal result should be followed up with a colonoscopy. Cervical cancer. Cervical cancer screening should begin at age 21. However, women below 21 years should not be screened. Women between 21 to 29 should have a pap screening done once in every three years. However, HPV screening should not be performed for this age group unless it is required after an abnormal pap test result. Women between 30 to 65 should have a pap test in addition to HPV test termed as co-testing done every five years. This is the most suggested approach. However, having a pap test alone is also okay for this age group. Women above 65 who have had regular cervical cancer screening for the past 10 years with normal results should not be tested for cervical cancer. Once screening is discontinued, it should not be started again. Women with a history of severe cervical precancer should continue screening for at least 20 years after that diagnosis, even if testing goes past age 65. The women whose uterus and cervix have been removed total hysterectomy for reasons not related to cervical cancer and without any cervical cancer history or severe precancer should not be screened. Women vaccinated against HPV should still follow the screening recommendations for their age groups. Women with a history of HIV infection, organ transplant, DES exposure, etc. may require a different screening schedule for cervical cancer. Breast cancer. Women from 40 to 44 should have the choice to start annual breast cancer screening with mammograms. Women from 45 to 54 should get yearly mammograms. Women above 55 may get mammograms once in every two years. Screening should continue as long as a woman is in good health and is expected to live more than 10 years. Women should be well informed with the known benefits, potential harms, and limitations linked to breast cancer screening. Certain women with a genetic tendency, family history, or certain other factors should get screened with MRIs along with mammograms. Endometrial cancer. I would recommend that during menopause, every woman should be informed about the risks and symptoms of endometrial cancer. Certain women with a disease history may need to opt for a yearly endometrial biopsy. Lung cancer. I would recommend yearly lung cancer screening with a low-dose CT scan for certain people prone to lung cancer who meet the following criteria. Aged between 55 to 74 years and maintaining good health. And stopped smoking in the past 15 years. And having a minimum of 30 packs per year smoking history. Prostate cancer. I would recommend that men make an informed decision after consulting with a physician whether to be screened for prostate cancer. Research has not yet proven that the benefits of screening outweigh the harms of testing and treatment. Therefore, I believe that men should not be screened without understanding about the risk factors and benefits of screening and treatment. Starting from the age of 50, men should consult a physician about the risk factors and benefits of screening so that they can decide if screening is right for them or not. If they are African American or have a father or brother who had prostate cancer before the age of 65, one should consult a physician right from the age of 45. If one decides to be screened, he should get a prostate-specific antigen blood test with or without a rectal exam. How often he will be tested will depend on his prostate-specific antigen level. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the doctor giving a lecture on the effect of disrupting gut-brain communication. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
According to research findings, disrupting gut-brain communication may affect memory and learning abilities. The link between memory and food is a fundamental human experience that we all can relate to. However, the findings have unveiled an intriguing explanation behind this phenomenon, illustrating how strongly the second brain in our gut communicates with our brain. A massive mesh of neurons termed as second brain lies inside our gastrointestinal tract. While this neuronal control system primarily functions independently to manage our digestive system, the study reveals that this neuronal control system communicates with the brain directly through a long nerve called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve mediates a great deal of metabolic communication between the gut and the brain. For instance, the study revealed how feeding behavior initiated by hippocampus activity is directly activated by vagal nerve stimulation, mediated by signals from the gastrointestinal tract. It appears obvious that signals from the gut would be communicating with the brain in this way, allowing us to know when we should stop eating. But what if these gut to hippocampus communications covered satiety clues or more than simple hunger? Could they also impact cognitive and other memory processes regulated by the hippocampus? A study conducted to on this topic that utilized a novel rodent model that terminates about 80% of gut to hippocampus communicators while still retaining fundamental brain to gut motor signaling. The study revealed that when this gut-brain pathway was detached, the rats displayed impaired episodic and spatial working memory. That means the rats could not effectively generate and access spatial memories provoked by the gastrointestinal system. With this disrupted pathway, a fascinating link between our gut and memory is hypothesized. When rats locate and eat a meal, the vagus nerve is activated and this global positioning system is engaged. Therefore, it would be advantageous for an animal to remember their external environment to locate the food again. The artificial electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve can increase memory function. However, this is the first study to find an endogenous connection from the gut through to the hippocampus that mediates this cognitive pathway. Interestingly, this study revealed that the specific vagal nerve disruption studied here did not affect social learning, body weight, or anxiety. The study concluded by raising a concern over the lack of research in this subject. It is recommended that common bariatric surgeries, such as a gastric bypass, have been found to reduce the effectiveness of vagal nerve signaling to the hippocampus. Moreover, a recently approved FDA obesity treatment called V-block therapy has been effective in weight loss by electrically disrupting the vagus nerve. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.